Good morning. I'm very pleased to open this session and uh, to uh, resume our work and give uh, and to announce the talk of um, Kaisa Matomeki from the University of Turku, Finland. She will speak on the distribution of Fourier coefficients of modular forms. So thank, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction please. and thanks for the organizers, organizers for inviting me here. It's a great honor to be speaking here. So I will talk about Fourier coefficients of modular forms and I don't like frightening people at my first sentence, so I have two alternative beginnings for the talk. So I will start with a sentence that is intended for those who are familiar with the modular forms. And just if you are not, don't listen to the first sentence and start the talk from the second sentence. So I take F, be a homomorphic Hecke cusp form for the full modular group. Okay, so that's the first sentence, and then I have a couple of sentences for the non-experts. So I'm talking about functions f, which are defined in the upper half plane of the complex plane. So here's the real axis, and here's the imaginary axis, and they are such that they are periodic in the way that it's enough to know the values on this area here, and this is actually not very important anyway, but what is important is that these cusp forms or modular forms are very important objects and you need them in, for instance, in the proof of Fermat's last theorem and in physics and in craft theory and so on. So they are very important things and it's important to study their properties. So we should be interested on how they behave and that's what I'm going to talk about today and everything we need to know about them I will tell you so you don't have to know very much about them anyway. So the first thing we know about them is that they have a Fourier expansion so we can write the FZ as a sum from 1 to infinity, that's because they are cusp forms, they are not, not zero term. And we have the Fourier coefficients lambda fn, and then we have a normalizing factor, n to k minus 1 over 2, and e n z, Hecke cusp form of even weight. Okay. And today I will be mainly interested in this Fourier coefficients lambda fn here and their properties because this, of course, defines the Fourier function. If we know very well the Fourier coefficients, we know about the function as well. And it's interesting kind of know how these things behave, these Fourier coefficients here. And I will first give some basic properties of them. We are talking about forms for the full modular group which implies that they are real numbers. That's important. And other important thing is that they are multiplicative. And a third classical fact due to the design is that they are bounded by divisor function. So the size of the coefficient is at most the divisor function, which is of size n to epsilon for any epsilon, so they are rather small. And some other more facts is that one knows that there is some cancellation. We know that these are real numbers and what I'm mostly talk about is their size, if they are positive or negative, and if there's cancellation in the sum of them and things like that. So we actually know that if we take the sum of the Fourier coefficients up to some x, then there's lots of cancellation. This is order 1 over 
trees are very small and with typical square root cancellation, so they, these coefficients cancel a lot. But on the other hand, of course, if we just knew this, it might be that all of these are very small and there's no cancellation due to sign changes. So another fact we know is that actually that's not the case. But if we take a sum over the squares of the coefficients, then this is a constant times x plus a smaller error for some positive constant. And if you remember that these coefficients were small, well, almost constant n to epsilon, then you can see from these two things that there must be some cancellation in the coefficients. If all of these were positive, then they would be roughly one on size and this could never hold. So there must be infinitely many negative and infinitely many positive Fourier coefficients. That's certain from this already. Hence we have that lambda Fn is positive and is negative for infinite many x n. But then you can ask more precise questions about these signs. All of this, of course, starts working only for large x. And you can ask what is smallest n such that lambda of n is negative. I mean, we have normalized these things essentially in a way that lambda f of 1 is 1, so it's positive. And anyway, these things are multiplicative, so if you find two primes on which this thing is negative, then in the product of two primes it's positive. So it's no point of asking what's the first positive Fourier coefficient, except that there's of course a problem about zero coefficients. But anyway, it's much more interesting to ask about the first negative coefficients because the multiplicativity guarantees that if you have negative coefficients, you will have positive coefficients. So that makes sense. And of course there is, because there are infinitely many of these cost forms, you have to have some parameter on terms of which you ask for this n. So we will talk how small the n must be in the terms of the weight. If you look at forms for more general groups, there are also the conductor parameter n, which you can get dependence on. But now we are interested in terms, terms of the weight k of the form, how small is the smallest n such that lambda of n must be negative. And the second question one can ask is that how many sign changes are there? These are there up to some x. Up to x. And well, you can ask more questions. You can ask, does these signs kind of characterize the form? Or do signs of lambda f say primes? determine the form. Uniquely. So if you have just a sequence of the signs of the coefficients, do you immediately know, well, this must be this particular modular form that has these signs of the coefficients. So you don't know the actual Fourier coefficients, you just know the signs of them. So does that determine their whole form. And I think in my abstract I promised to talk about symmetric power L functions as well, and I might talk about the question two for them, but if I don't have time I won't because it's not that different from the question for the axial modular form. But anyway, I will start with question one and then go on to questions two and three, and depending on the time I will talk about them. So for the first question, what is the smallest negative coefficient? I will present a theorem, which is a couple of years old. So 
let's consider the case when the weight is large. That's always what we are interested in. Then the theorem says that there exists an n which is of size at most k to half such that lambda f n hat is negative. And actually, I should say, this looks nice, this one half, but actually one knows that n hat hat is at most k to 0.46 four nine six three and why I'm mentioning this is that there is an application for real zeros of modular forms for which it was important that this exponent here is actually less than half and I should say that it's poor luck that we got around to point four nine six three which is just below one half. But because it we get nicer parameter choices if we just prove this for half so I will do that but the method works slightly more than for the half. And this improves a previous result, which is do Kowalski Lau Sounderatzen and Wu, who showed that N hat is at most k to 3 over 5. And if you happen to look at these papers, the exponents are not the same, but that's because in the papers we don't consider the full modular group, but we have the more general case, and then we have the conductor, and we don't have so good bounds for the L function, and it gives you slightly different exponents, but the idea is exactly the same. So it's not important. And this problem can be seen as a generalization of the question about the least quadratic non-residue. So this is SL2 analog for asking about the least quadratic non-residue as that's the first negative that the Dirichlet character takes. And the, now we look at SL2 L functions and we look at the first negative coefficient of them. So this generalizes that problem. And I will say a few words how you can approach this question. The problem is that you can't approach through L functions really because you are looking at so small coefficients. We are at the weight to the half, so we can't say much from the L function side or from analytic side. But instead, we use a trick, which I will explain in a few minutes. But Let's first choose our perimeters. So let's take y equal to k to half. And let's take x equal to y to 4 over 3 plus epsilon. And we study sum of these Fourier coefficients up to x lambda f n and this is just a technical thing that we look at square free coefficients don't care about this too much. But just in case somebody asks me what about the non-square free coefficients we look at the sum only for square free coefficients. So we we show two bounds for this. We show an upper bound and a lower bound for this, and they contradict in case there are no negative eigenvalues below the k to half. First, we know that if we use a subconvexity bound due to Peng and Utila and Motohashi, I think, for heck L functions. This gives you quickly that if you look at the sum we are talking about, 
it must be u2 of x. So if you look things up to y2 for over 3, which is up to k2 two thirds, then you get some cancellation. This is what the result really says. But the problem is that we are interested in looking at things up to k to half only. Because this already almost tells you that there must be some sign changes up to this x because there is some cancellation in the sum. But the x is k to two thirds and we want to do k to half in order to get our theorem. But there is a similar trick that is used in the thing for the first quadratic non-residue that you can do for these co coefficients as well. And we will sketch the following proposition. So if lambda f n is positive for every n at most y, that's the contradiction to our, in contradiction to our theorem, then one has that this sum we study has size at least constant times x for some positive constant c as soon as x is large enough or oh, yeah, as k is large enough. And of course, this proposition immediately implies our theorem if you take it together with this, because this says that, oh, there is cancellation in the sum. And this says that, well, the sum is at least constant time x if this is greater than equal to zero for every n. So there must be something negative be before y, otherwise both this and this couldn't hold. So the only thing which is left is showing that indeed this proposition holds. And for that, we use something similar to the quadratic non-residue case. So, First, note that, of course, if every Fourier coefficient is positive up to y, then in particular, every prime coefficient is positive. And also we know that the Fourier coefficients are bound by the divisor function, which implies that lambda f p is at least minus 2 for every p. In particular, for every p less than x, that's all we are interested in. But then comes in something that was first used by Ivanietz and Sarnak when they considered infinity norms of, of modular forms. And that's a relation which comes from the fact that we are considering Hecke forms. So we have the Hecke relation that implies that lambda f p squared is the same as lambda f p squared minus 1. So this is a very important relation here. And in particular, it implies because this thing here must be positive, then p is at most by to half. So this gives you that lambda f. Let me write it other way. So this here is positive if p is at most y to half, because this is positive for every p squared less than y. And Together with this fact, this implies that lambda f p must be at least 1 for p at most. 
one half. So we get something about the coefficient. Now we know at least that there's something positive happening, so we might hope that we get a lower bound like this. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So let's erase this. We don't need it anymore. I think we keep the theorem, yes. And I will recall again the questions as we arrive to them, so it's not a problem to erase them, I guess. All right, so what we will now do now is we define another multiplicative function, h of p, which we define to be minus 2 for p between y and x, and we define it to be 0 for p between y to half and y, and we define it to be 1 for p less than y to half. And by what I just said, we get this be multiplicative. And note that this lambda f p has size at least h p for every p. by the lower right corner of the board. And it's not difficult to see. This is something that Kowalski, Lausand, and Wu already did, and it's kind of classic, I think, that if you take the sum of lambda fn up to x, then this is larger than the sum of hn. So it's not that e every e lambda fn would be larger than hn because there are some negative stuff, but the sum is indeed smaller if you change from lambda fn to hn. So it's enough to solve the lower bound for hn. And well, hn is very well defined here, so it's no problem to write this as a sum n up to x. p divides n implies p less than 1 to half. Here the hn is by multiplicative always 1. And then there are some stuff which have prime factors greater than y. So we sum over primes greater than y. And here the h function is minus 2. And then we had the rest where the, again, it's enough to look at things with prime factors smaller than y to half. Like this, because here it's zero in between. And because due to our choice of x, this condition here is actually redundant. If p is greater than y, then we don't need this condition anymore here. And this is a sum which is easy to calculate. It's kind of sum over smooth numbers, which an analytic number here theorists can do. And this is greater than c times x for certain c greater than 0 when you choose y equal to x to 10 over 9. So this is actually what Kowalski, Lausanne, and Wu did. And that's how they did this result with k to 3 over 5 here. But the problem is that in order to get my result, you have to be able to choose your y to be larger than this. And it makes things more complicated here. OK, so let's erase my theorem. But then the most natural and thing that Im immediately springs to your mind is to use more of these hack relations 
So one has knows that if you take lambda f p cubed, then it will be lambda f p cubed minus 2 lambda f p. And working as before, you get that lambda f p is greater than square root of 2 for p greater than y to 1 over 3. And then you have a regression for lambda fp to the power 4. And you can continue and continue this process. Actually, you get that lambda fp is greater than 2 times cosine of pi over m plus 1 for p uh, smaller than y at most y to 1 over m. So this is not difficult to get. And then you can you do the same thing. You can define h differently. So you get much more complicated h. Or the h itself is not that complicated yet. You just have that it's this cosine thing for different intervals here. So you get a similar sum, but now you can't do this just by easily by hand because you well in order to get the result with point six, I think you have to use fifty of these things or sixty of these things for 60 for 50 different m so you can't just by hand decompose the sum and then look at the different components and this indeed leads to a integral equation which is normal for sums of multiplicative functions and then i transformed it to a different so different equation And in such equation, you can do the numerics rather easily. You don't have to care about that. You have these things up to 50. And again, you get an arrow which says this is OK. So I have only thought about all the trivial parts of the argument. So this is not very difficult either. But this is the kind of the work is in these two lines here. But it's no point of explaining it very in details. But anyway, this implies the theorem. You get that the corresponding sum here is actually of size at least cx for certain c, thanks to this difference or different equation and solving it. So now we have got through the first question concerning the coefficients. And I will go to the second question. And you can forget about everything I said about the first question. That's not relevant anymore. And you can also wake up if you got asleep during the first thing. So the second question was that how many sign changes are there in these coefficients up to some x? So to measure that, we make a Definition, we get n f plus minus x be the number of x's such that lambda f n is positive or negative. So plus for positive and minus for negative. And let me state the theorem on this. So it says that if we take 
epsilon and eta positive and take sigma to be either plus or minus, then n f sigma of x plus x to epsilon minus n f sigma of x has size at least x to epsilon minus eta for almost all x. of size x. So that by almost all I mean that there are x over log a to x, exceptions for any x, for any a. And so almost all very short intervals contain positive coefficients and almost all very short intervals contain negative coefficients, so there must be lots of sign changes indeed. If we look at the sequence lambda fn up to x, it has of order x to 1 minus epsilon sign changes. And actually using a bit different argument, I can show that it has x over log square of, x of x or something like that sign changes, but I'm not going to talk about that today. We will concentrate on this easier case. And I should say that this theorem here improves a very recent work by Wu and Chai, who saw that if you take epsilon to be at least 3 over 7, then positive proportion of these intervals contains positive and negative coefficients. So this is quite a bit better that we can take epsilon instead of 3 over 7 and we get that almost all intervals instead of a positive proportion of the intervals. And also this corollary is before known for x to half instead of x to 1 minus epsilon. Now, it's very sleepy. <laughs> Sorry about that. And again, it's, oh, I told you to forget everything about the previous proof, but what is similar is that we look at certain sum and so two bounds for it which, um, which make a contradiction if this theorem is not true. So again, let's sketch the proof a bit. We will show that for almost all x's, we have that if we take the sum of the coefficients in a short interval, with absolute values outside, then this is of order x to, say, 2 over 3 times epsilon. So the length of the interval is x to epsilon, so there is plenty of cancellation. And on the other hand, we saw that if we take the same sum, but with the absolute values inside the sum, then this thing has size at least x to epsilon over log cubed x. So these two things again show that there must be a sign change in this short interval, because otherwise we couldn't have both of these. This would also be of size x to epsilon. And indeed, by looking at the sum, it's very easy to see that you get the amount of sign changes that I promised to you, thanks to the the lines bound that is bounded by the device of function. Anyway, these two things certainly show that there must be sign changes in this very short interval. So I should show one and show two, and then we are done with the theorem. And the proof of one is pretty easy. 
and the proof of two needs a uh, little trick about the saving. So I'm a multiplicative number theorist, so I make everything to be about multiplicative number theory and forget about the modular forms, in particular with the case two, the one uses properties of these things more. So let's start with proof of one. So it's enough to show that if we sum over all x's and we take the square of the sum, then this has size x to 1 plus epsilon, because then too many of these can't be too large if we have this kind of average. And this is actually pretty easy, as I say, thanks to our good knowledge about these things. So if we just square left-hand side out, we get sum of x's, and then we have n1 and n2 in this short interval, and lambda f n1, lambda f n2, and if we write n1 minus n2 equal h, then this is about the same thing as summing over h from minus x to epsilon to x to epsilon, then there is some question about the multiplicity of occurrence of each edge, but anyway we get a sum over everything of lambda f n times lambda f n plus h. Like this. And this is a convolution sum which is well studied, and one knows that if h is not zero, then this is actually although x to two thirds for h not zero. And on the other hand, if h equals zero, then this is just a sum of squares of these coefficients, which I had on the very first board, which was a constant times x. So all in all, believe me that this is although x to one plus epsilon. So this main term coming from the h equals to zero, guys, we have x to epsilon here, and this is of size x. So in total, it's of size x to one plus epsilon. So this first thing is proved, and it implied this bound for the absolute value of the sum. So now we have to prove this number two, and for that I will use a gamma. Gamma which tells about the behavior of the coefficients at the primes. It says that there are alpha and delta, which are positive, such that if we look at the primes around some x, such that lambda f p has absolute value at least alpha, and compare it with the number of all primes around x. I need to cheat a bit and take a space from here. Then this has density larger than half. So it says that more than, for more, more than half of the primes, these lambda fps are bounded on absolute value by a constant. And I won't go into proof at all, but I will instead explain why it implies this thing here. So this, of course, it 
is a direct consequence of the Satotet conjecture, which is proved with this, so you can use it, but you can also prove it without Satotet conjecture if you don't want to use it. So for the proof of two, we take P to be the set of primes around x to epsilon over 2, such that lambda fp has absolute value at least this alpha. And we take r to be the set of primes around x to 1 minus epsilon, such that again lambda fp has absolute value at least alpha. So both these sets have density a bit larger than alpha in the primes by the above lemma. And let us now consider the sum we are interested in. So we have this sum. So this is certainly larger than alpha cubed times a sum of products from the sets I have here, P1, P2, R, from the same short interval, with P1 and P2 from P, and R from R1. Okay, it would make sense to actually write it in other form. Sorry about that. So let's write this as a set. P1, P2, R from P times P times R such that the product is from the short interval. Okay, so that's certainly the case because these are all have coefficient at least alpha. And this we write in another form. Let's write it here so they can use the previous thing. So we take P1, P2, and R, so that P1 is any prime, and otherwise we do what we used to do, minus the same thing such that P1, this is any prime from the interval. So that this product belongs to P complementing the primes times P times R and this same interval. So I have done nothing but replaced this by the set of all primes minus the complement. And now these things becomes only smaller if I make this larger. So I can replace the set P here by the set of all primes by replacing that equality by inequality here. And now we have these kinds of sets here, where we have one prime from the set of all primes, and otherwise some stuff. And for these, one can use a result which is typically used when you consider primes in almost all short intervals. You can relate such uh, thing in a very short interval to a similar thing in longer intervals, if you can bound a mean value of Dirichlet polynomials. And in this case, we have here the set of all primes. So one of the Dirichlet polynomials which appears is theta prime over theta, for which we know we know for the theta zero free region, so we can approximate or we can bound that Dirichlet polynomial well enough that we can actually get asymptotic formulas for these sets, thanks to the fact that there is this set of all primes. Otherwise, we couldn't do that because we wouldn't have the bound for the Dirichlet polynomial. But anyway, using that thing here, we get asymptotic formula for this and asymptotic formula for this. There are some technical ideas, like you have to replace the set R by a well-behaving subset, but we don't care about that right now. But anyway, thanks to the asymptotic formula, we get that this thing here is half plus delta minus half minus delta times c times x epsilon over log cubed x. 
and these things appear here because the density of p was one half plus delta, and the density of p complement is then one half minus delta. So all in all, this difference here is positive. So we get that this is of one this size. And we can get rid of some logarithms if one wants to, but it's easier to do it this way. So this finishes the proof of the second statement here. And we get the theorem, which I haven't yet erased. So we got, get that in almost all short intervals you get sign changes. And so they are positive and negative signs. So this sequence has lots of sign changes. And as I said, and as I promised in my abstract, you can do the similar thing for symmetric power L function coefficients instead of the coefficients of the Heck L function. But in that case, you don't have the formula one so well. So instead, one looks here a set of primes for which this is positive and does a bit of similar thing. And for even symmetric power L functions, one gets exactly the same result as here. But for B, and that's thanks to the fact that there are more positive, more negative coefficients than positive for coefficients for them. But in case of odd symmetric power L functions, there are as many positive as negative coefficients in the first place. So it's more difficult to do the short intervals. And one needs a much more complicated Sivin argument than this basic trick here. Or at least a little bit more complicated thing. And even so the result is that there are x to half sign changes. And in the while proving that one uses even Primus theorem from additive combinatorics, which is quite nice, but I really don't want to spend too much time on it. So I talk about the third question I mentioned instead of these symmetric powers. So the third question was that do the signs of the Fourier coefficients determine the form? And for that one, I again present first a theorem. So if we have two forms, F1 and F2, which are holomorphic Hecke cusp forms, they don't have to be of same weight. But anyway. So if the Fourier coefficients come of F1 and F2, have same sign, for at least 76% of primes. Then F1 must equal F2. And what I mean by the infinitely many primes, for, so what I mean by 76% is actually analytic density, but it's weaker not notion than, than the natural density. So anyway, you can just think that, well, 76% of the primes. So one would expect that for any given two F1 and F2, about, at about half of the primes, they have the same sign, and about the half of the primes, they have different sign. And if you had the pair substitute, then it would be a theorem that they have about half of the time the same sign and half of the time the different sign. But this theorem shows that well, they have the same sign for at most 76% of the time. And on the other hand, they have different sign for at most 76% of the time. And this again improves a result by Kowalski, Lau, Sandratsan, and Wu in the same paper who showed that same theorem with 97% instead of 76%. So they saw that if the signs coincide in 97% of the primes, then the forms must be the same. 
And I should say that I have also a similar result, but instead of looking at the thing that they have the same sign, it's that if the absolute value of the coefficients differs a little bit only. So if lambda f1 p minus lambda f2 p is smaller than 1 over 50 for, say, I think I have a bit better result than this, but for at least 51% of primes. Now you don't have to care about complex multiplication if you take the 51% itself of something slightly below 50. Then F1 must equal F2. So in theory, this is something that you could use numerically because now you have, you, they don't have to be exactly the same, but you have this kind of, you are allowed a bit, little bit error, so you can calculate this and look if they are the same. Almost, almost same, where you don't need, of course, 51% for numerics because you accept, if they are the same, they must be always the same. But if you, can, if you don't find, uh, or if you find that they are essentially the same numerically, then the forms must be the same, so you don't have to care about the error terms in the calculations anymore, except that this, of course, holds only for very, very large primes, so it's not practical. I don't know if you could make it practical, but... As it is, it's not practical because you look at the analytic density and I haven't done explicit things there. So in the last 10 minutes, I will also talk a bit about the proof of this question or the things concerning this question three. So the point is that you know quite a bit about these coefficients. There are lots of things that the, now you, now you really use the theory of the L function and representations to get some information how these things behave and what happens. So you know things like if you take the sum of all primes and yeah, multiple two coefficients lambda f to b, and you look at the sum of p to the sigma, then this converges for sigma tending to one from the plus side. So if these coefficients were just one, or if, if you had absolute signs here, then this wouldn't converge because one over, sum of one over p doesn't converge. And on the other hand, I will list a couple of identities to kind of show that what sort of things you know. So you know that if we take, instead of just looking at the product, you look at the square, so we get rid of the cancellation. you get that the sum doesn't converge anymore, but you get the main term of one over p. So everything happens for sigma tending to one. So this shows that there must be some cancellation. If you had always, f1 and f2 always had the same sign, there would be a problem, or well, there would be a very soon a problem with these two things and the thing that these are bounded by, the, by two. So there must be, some positive proportion of this lambda fp. So there must be some primes for which the sign is not the same. And the point is to try to find out that how large a percentage of the primes must be such that the signs can't coincide. So the work of Kowalski, Lausanne, and Wu used this and a neat trick to do that. And there are also more you can say you can say that if you take coefficients at prime powers p to h1 and lambda f to p to h2 and sigma this is 
again converges if this H I saw at most four by the symmetry and non-vanishing of the symmetric power L functions and cranking cellular properties. And then you can even use, if you want, the satellite conjecture to have the distribution of this lambda f and so on. So there are lots of things you know about them, but the problem is how to use all this information you have. How you conclude from something like that, something like this. That's kind of the trouble that you have to do, deal with. And as I said, Kowalski, Lausanne, and Wu had a nice trick for using these two first things. But if you want to use more information, you have to do something more. You can't just trick around. So let's say a few words about how to approach this then. And the, there are two steps. First, discretize the problem and then use linear programming. So we want, instead of these relations with powers, so this thing here is a polynomial of lambda fp and so on. So you have these powers here, and it's complicated to deal with those things. So the first thing is discretize and make the problem linear. And for that, we write c plus minus of i and j to be the measure. I don't define the measure, but just believe that there is some kind of measure going around of those primes such that the Fourier coefficient of f1 is in a short interval like this. Oh. And on the other hand, the Fourier coefficient of f2 is at another short interval. And lambda f one times lambda f two is positive or negative depending on the plus or minus. And then using these C's, you can kind of transform all these conditions here to linear conditions on the measures on these C plus minus things. You have to be careful doing upper and lower bounds, but it's just a little bit of work to do that. So you get linear conditions for this C plus minus I and J by just putting stuff here, lower bounds and upper bounds. These are here polynomials, so it's easy to find the maximums and minimums in this very short ranges. You take K to be 100 or something like that. And you get linear conditions for those Cs and then use the linear programming. So basically, you use an algorithm which tells you that, well, the sum of the negative C mice, C i chase, must be at least of this size if all these linear relations we get from there hold for these numbers C. And that's the way you get the, it says that, well, it's 0.24 that you must have the sum of these measures in order to have all these in a relations holding for the C's. And so modulo the numerics this concludes the proof of this thing. And the second thing is proved exactly the same way, but you get different in a relations for these CIs. Or you get a different thing to maximize or minimize for this thing. But the relations are exactly the same that you are going to use for this thing. So we get that. We are done also with the application number three, so I think I'm now done with all the applications, so I'm done with the talk. Thank you.
Are there any questions, please? Yes, please. Are there no uh, are there no cost performance for the uh, sign of uh, coefficient coincide? Uh, and I know I, I mean that. Do you have uh, lower lower bounds of uh, so you you gave upper bounds seventy six percent, but do you have lower bounds? Uh, you get the same lower bound, so they also must have different sign for at least. 24% of the time. Yes. So you get exactly the same result. So you, you look only at the cusp forms. Yes. So it doesn't Are there any other questions, please? Yeah. So I think you. Are you formulate your results about uh, Hecke eigenforms. Yes. So it's really about the eigenvalues, not so much about the Fourier coefficients. Yes, yes. So what happens if you drop the condition to be eigenform? I think there are problems because I use the multiplicativity and Hecke yeah, yeah, yeah. relations yeah. so but much, so I, I, don't, I don't have results. Can you save anything? I, th I think one can say something on some questions, but I can't say kind of immediately anything. But I think somebody has studied the related questions as well. For Okay. Case, but it, it, it makes things more complicated, certainly. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions, please? So then, thank the speaker again, please.